I'm Julie Fannin. I am the manager of the marketing team at Naturalist Journeys, and we're really excited to have you here. Um, we have Brian Clock ready to talk to you about our Texas Hill Country trip in April, and he's also going to touch on a few other of his tours coming up, and we're really excited to hear what he has to say. Um, we'll have about a 45-minute presentation, and then... 15 minutes of a question and answer. So if you all want to type your questions into the comment bar, we'll go through those at the end. Um, and from here, we will pass the screen over to Brian. He'll share his screen and we'll get started. Thanks everyone. All right, thanks everybody. Um, give me just a second to get my screen going. Um, so this evening I'm gonna be focusing on uh, my upcoming Texas Hill Country tour. Um, <clears throat> part of the reason I'm uh, choosing to talk about this this evening um, is that this year we're running a slightly different itinerary than we have in the past. Um, I was wanting to incorporate a little bit more of the western edge of the hill country, try for a couple of specific birds out that way. Uh, but anyway, we'll get right into it. So the general itinerary um, of the trip. We're going to be starting uh, Friday, April 26th, flying into San Antonio and then driving over to Uvalde. Uh, it's about an hour and a half drive further west. Uh, our first day, we're going to be at Kickapoo Cavern State Park in the morning and then Fort Clark Springs for the afternoon. Um, these are in the, just the next county further west from Uvalde. The next day, we'll be at Cook Slough Nature Park right in town in Uvalde. And then we will travel up to Neil's Lodges uh, near Concan, Texas. Uh, the next day we'll be birding in the Concan area. <clears throat> and then in the evening visiting the Rio Frio Bat Cave, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, and then our last full day in the field will be at Lost Maples State Natural Area. And then Wednesday, May 1st will be our departures. So what is the Hill Country? So the Hill Country generally is this region in central or sort of west central Texas that's defined uh, to the east and the south by the Balcones Escarpment and to the northwest by the Edwards Plateau. Uh, it sits at about um, around 2,000 feet elevation at the top of the hills, um, but it's just this region of gent gently rolling hills that are about 600 feet or so higher than the surrounding plains. Um, they're made up of a porous limestone uh, that was deposited when this was all a shallow sea about 100 to 200 million years ago, and then it was uplifted about 20 million years ago, causing that rise from the surrounding areas. It's all limestone, so this limestone uh, is eroded chemically uh, by rain and water as it flows through, creating all these pores, and those pores grow, and there's, so there's this uh, extensive cave network system throughout the whole region as well as the Edwards Aquifer, which lies below. So groundwater, super important to the region. Um, and it also feeds a lot of springs across the region. So lots of flowing water, lots of lush areas <clears throat> all across the hill country. Um, and we will be situated, like I mentioned, in Uvalde, which is right here, sort of that southwestern corner of the hill country. Um, so now we know what the hill country is, but why do we care to visit? Why are we doing a whole trip there, basically? Um, so for me, habitat is the key. So in this particular region where we will be visiting, um, we're kind of at this uh, confluence between the this hill country region to the north and the brush country to the south. So two kind of extremes um, shown here with this uh, hill country habitat on the left with lots of lush greenery, water flowing, uh, crystal clear uh, streams pouring out of the limestone. And then the brush country on the right is more that scrubby, more arid habitat, uh, still beautiful in its own right, uh, especially to me. Um, and so to sort of exemplify this or uh, show you why these eco regions coming together leads to diversity or just give you some examples, I'm gonna show you a few range maps of a few species to kind of make this point and I'll reveal the which species these maps belong to later on in the in the PowerPoint. Um, so in this case we have a bird that's pretty widespread across the east 
and we find that it's uh, it makes its westernmost breeding population right in the Uvalde, Texas area. So breeding range shown here in orange, uh, purple is year round, blue winter, yellow is migration. Um, in this example, we see a bird that's more common across the Southwest, sort of the mirror image of that. And we, it has a few little scattered breeding populations, including one that finds its easternmost limit uh, just west of Uvalde near Del Rio. Another species that's non-migratory, widespread tropical species comes up and finds the northernmost limit of its range here in South Texas. This range map looks a little dated. They're actually a little bit further north than that. Um, and then we even have one species that really makes its living in the hill country. And so that question, why visit um, for birders? Uh, this particular species is often one of the main reasons that people come to visit uh, birders. And that species is the golden-cheeked warbler. So um, exclusively breeding in the Texas Hill Country, migrating across Mexico, and then wintering here in Central America. Um, but that restricted breeding area means that every single golden-cheeked warbler is a Texan by birthright. So golden-cheeked warblers, um, really iconic to the region. Uh, these are all males, uh, the top left and the two, two on the bottom with a jet black cap and back, um, nice black clean line going from the bill to the eye and extending behind the eye almost, almost all the way out of the yellow. Um, of course, those bright contrasting yellow golden cheeks, uh, black throat, nice bright wing bars streaking down the flanks and the females kind of have this uh, yellowish wash almost on top of the black, on top of their head and back. Um, so not quite as jet black as the males. Um, and so habitat that we look for, I, I mentioned habitat is key. So I'm gonna be talking about habitat quite a bit. So when we're looking for golden cheek warblers, we're looking for a very specific habitat. Um, and that's within the hill country, um, this dense mosaic woodland, typically on uh, these hillsides. And within that woodland, we specifically are looking for mature ash juniper. Uh, also another common name for it is uh, cedar, um, but really specifically the mature trees, so 30 years or older. And this is because these juniper trees, as they age, the bark along the trunk and the branches starts to shed and kind of slough off in these really fibrous sheets. And the golden cheek warblers use those fibers in constructing their nest. So it's not that they particularly need these juniper trees to nest in, but it's the materials that they gather from it for their nests. Um, in fact, you often find them nesting in oaks nearby like uh, red oak or shin oak. And sites that we'll be looking for them on this tour include Kickapoo Cavern State Park, the Concan area and Lost Maples State Natural Area. And so in this picture, um, I was this was taken while I was in high school. And I'm standing on top of one of these hills, kind of looking back out across. Um, this is sort of a classic hill country scene here. And if you look, uh, hopefully you can see my mouse pointer, but here sort of straight ahead down the road, you see this sort of low area that sweeps up into my left along this hill that I'm on. And in that low area, you can see a lot of different colors. So these are all different species of trees, some lime greens, dark greens, grays, yellows. So that's that mosaic woodland we're talking about. Um, these dark greens are those junipers. So nice, big, mature ash juniper. Um, so this morning I was specifically targeting golden cheek warblers. Um, and I found a couple of pairs here in this wash. Um, and if you look closely at this picture, you'll notice maybe a couple of buildings here on the hillside, kind of ahead and to the right. And this rightmost building um, is the dining area of Neil's Lodges, where we'll be staying. So just across the street from Golden Cheek Warblers. So some more images of that hill country habitat, again, rolling, smooth rolling hills, um, lots of juniper, and these stream beds that cut through so this one appears dry on the surface, but almost certainly has water flowing 
through the limestone underneath. And so in these sort of lush areas of the hill country with lots of big mature trees, uh, particularly along the rivers and streams that are lined with sycamores and cypress trees, um, we're looking for other species of warbler as well. So yellow-throated being one of them. And there's an answer to your, one of your little range map quiz. Uh, this is the westernmost limit of the yellow-throated warblers breeding range. Black and white warblers, Louisiana water thrush, northern perulas, and interestingly also tropical perulas are uh, somewhat expected in this area. And what happens when you have these two extremely closely related species overlapping at the fringes of both of their ranges, um, you get hybrid birds like this. So this is a rough range map I drew up of the range of northern perula and tropical perula. And you see right here in the Uvalde areas where their ranges overlap, um, there's quite a robust breeding population of tropical perulas just to the west on the Devil's River. Uh, but we get strays that wander over um, and stray northerns that wander over. And, and there's only a few perulas in town, I guess you take what you get. Um, but we get these intermediate sort of physical traits. So the underside of this bird looking a lot like a tropical perula with bright yellow going all the way down um, past into the belly but we see white eye arcs, which are typical of the Northern Perula, like this one. And then we don't see that dark necklace like we should see on a Northern Perula. So anyway, very interesting phenomenon. Um, one of the only places that this, these two species overlap. Uh, but away from the lush areas of the hills are some drier slopes. So you, you can see here, we've got Sotol uh, growing. That's a sort of grassy plant. The juniper is shorter and more spread out. Um, you see more bare ground. There's wahio growing here, some spiny hackberry. And on these drier slopes, we look for a different set of birds, um, including the black-capped vireo, um, almost as iconic to Texas as the golden cheek warbler, um, although there is a pretty strong breeding population of these in the Wichita Mountains in Oklahoma and a couple other places outside Texas. Um, but these are a conservation success story. So they used to be listed as a federally endangered species, like golden cheek warbler still is, by the way. Um, but thanks to uh, habitat uh, work, as well as um, culling of brown-headed cowbirds, their numbers have rebounded substantially. So we hope to see these in a number of places during the trip. And this is the male, and this is the female with sort of the grayer hood. Now views like this of black cap vireos are very uncommon, <clears throat> super shy, secretive species, but we'll have lots of chances. Hopefully we'll get a nice view. Another vireo we hope to see uh, is the gray vireo. And this is another answer to your range map quiz. Um, these we look for at Kickapoo Cavern State Park specifically. There's a small population there right at the fringe of their range, like I mentioned. Uh, we should also see Woodhouse's scrub jays, black-throated sparrows, and hopefully with some luck, varied bunting, again at Kickapoo Cavern State Park. So that's the hill country, kind of on the north side of where we'll be visiting. And to the south is the South Texas brush country, which is a semi-arid scrubland. So to kind of step back a little bit, um, give you a better idea of everything I'm talking about. So here's Uvalde. You're on the right side of the screen, about halfway up. And we have this green line kind of cutting across the north and to the east. And north of this line is the hill country. So we see these sort of ridges and uh, looks like wrinkles basically on the surface. Um, so those are all the hills that come through. We see rivers cutting through. This is the Nueces River. And all this land here to the south is South Texas brush country. Um, so you see it's pretty flat, lots of gray. 
And this blue line here is the Rio Grande River and of course, Mexico on the other side. So that brush country is predominantly Tamalipan thorn scrub. So features of this habitat, um, it should be in a healthy Tamalipan thorn scrub. It should be a rich diversity of scrub species. So Ceniso, um, black brush acacia, mesquites, like um, weesatch, uh, lope bush, a whole bunch of things. Um, and through it, I mentioned a network of streams. Uh, these come out of the hills or they come right out of the ground underneath the brush country as well. Um, some of them dry, some of them perennial. Um, and along those sort of waterways, you find larger trees like oaks and cedar elms. Um, and so in this brush country, it's looking for a slightly different set of birds like cactus wrens and Buick's wrens, verdans. Um, we hope to see these um, special little birds are the only member of their family we have here in the US. And they build these really interesting uh, nests that are fairly easy to spot. Hopefully we'll find some. Harris's hawks. Um, in my personal experience, this is the this is a region I grew up birding. Um, and I used to see these a lot more frequently than I do now in this part of their range for whatever reason, but we'll still be hoping to find them. Pyroloxia, sort of the dry uh, desert version of the Northern Cardinal. We'll have both Cardinals and Pyroloxias around. And Cass and Sparrow with a very impressive song and aerial display. Um, and within the brush country, you know, it's not all that um, dry scrub. There are those streams that cut through. And we'll be birding along a couple of those streams, uh, those wetland areas at Fort Clark Springs and Cook Slough. Uh, Fort Clark Springs being the location uh, where I grew up birding. Hopefully y'all were able to hear that. Um, but that was just kind of a moment there at Fort Clark Springs. Um, so again, back to this map, you see this is all that brush country and there are some very clearly defined waterways that are cut through it. So this very dark green vein here, um, this is uh, Lost Morris Creek, which is what runs through Fort Clark Springs, just south of Brackettville here. Um, and off to the east, just um, inside Uvalde city limits, is Cook Slough, which is an, another example of similar habitat. We'll get to visit both. So in these riparian woodlands, we see some really massive old trees that are primarily uh, Texas pecan and live oak. And they create these highways for migratory birds and other wildlife. So birds that we'll be looking for in these riparian zones are some classic South Texas specialty birds like great kiskadees, green jays, which that is the other answer to your range map quiz, uh, coming to the northern limit of their range. Olive sparrows, also fairly common, easy to hear, difficult to see. Long-billed thrashers um, and the water brings in water loving birds. So those include black bellied whistling ducks, green kingfishers. So this is a nice male here with this reddish sort of brick color across the breast. And then of course was a female there with uh, just green and white across the breast. Um, if we're lucky, we'll also get to find a ringed kingfisher. So green, which I just mentioned, um, those are small. So if you're familiar with belted kingfisher, it's think of, in your mind, think about half the size of the belted kingfisher, that's the green. And then about 50% larger than your belted kingfisher. Um, 
is the ringed kingfisher. So huge. Uh, also, we have a good chance for Mexican duck. This used to be part of the mallard species complex, but now it's its own thing. Uh, so this is a male actually. So pretty different from a male mallard, um, but they have that yellowish bill, just like a male mallard does. A bird uh, that we should hear pretty frequently, uh, fairly difficult to see is yellow-billed cuckoo. Lots of wild turkeys running around, and this is the Rio Grande subspecies of wild turkey. Um, and I just want to mention before I forget, uh, this is also a good season for wildflowers. So these here are Texas blue bonnets, which are super um, iconic to Texas. It's our state flower, uh, but there should be lots of things blooming. I would say blue bonnets peak towards the early end of April, but I like verbena should be going crazy, um, phlox, paintbrush, all sorts of things, but it all depends on the rain. Um, a year in the hill country, you can go either a whole year with just 10 inches of rain or you can get multiple feet of rain. So it's, it's boom and bust um, and it makes all the difference. So hopefully we'll get enough rain to have a good wildflower show. But um, some other uh, highlights that we hope to see as far as birds go during the week, um, painted bunting are fairly common throughout the area, uh, male and female. Um, painted bunting actually was my spark bird. Uh, whoops, sorry. Um, so one year, my mom used to always feed the birds. And uh, there was one year where we had a couple dozen males coming to our feeders at one time. This was when I was about 10 years old. So that really caught my attention. And uh, the rest is history. So that was the bird that got me into birding. Um, so even if they're not quite that common, we should see plenty of painted buntings. Summer tanagers also common throughout the riparian areas. Vermilion flycatchers, fortunately also very common. Um, here's an image of a female feeding some nestlings in their nest. Uh, Roadrunners also around um, if they choose to be seen. We have five breeding species of oriole. So these four are the most common that we uh, have a really good chance of seeing with bullocks here at the top left, scots at the top right, hooded bottom right, and orchard bottom left. The scots tend to be up in the hills with the golden cheek warblers um, and the other three more widespread. This was a nice singing Scots Oriole in the top of a pinyon pine. And the fifth breeding species of Oriole is Audubon's Oriole. Uh, if, again, if we're lucky, we might get to find one. Um, sometimes they're hanging out at Cook Slough, sometimes they're at Lost Maples, but we're right at the fringe of their range. And also they're just a really enigmatic species. Um, they are happy in the hills, they're happy in the brush country but their population in the region just ebbs and flows. And it doesn't even, not necessarily even seasonally. Um, sometimes they show up in the winter, sometimes they stay and breed. And um, Anyway, if we're lucky, we'll get to see Audubons. Another super common bird that we'll see often as we're driving um, along the fence lines and power lines are scissor tail flycatchers, just absolutely gorgeous. I took, definitely took them for granted when I was living there. Lesser goldfinch, particularly the black-backed or Texas subspecies, super high contrast, black back, yellow front. Blue grosbeak, fairly common. Yellow-breasted chats are uh, can be hyper abundant, especially along the riparian areas of Fort Clark Springs, um, just tons of chats. Purple martins, it's very popular to have a purple martin house in your backyard. Um, Black-chinned hummingbirds, that's gonna be our um, 
sort of default hummingbird that will still be in migration and should be a fair number of ruby threaded moving through. But black chinned is the predominant breeding species in the area. In addition to the two vireos that I mentioned before, black capped and gray, there are five other breeding species of vireo. So white eyed, yellow throated, red eyed, Huttons, and bells in the middle. Um, each with their own habitat preferences and their own little quirks. And then with this being, uh, this tour being right in the peak of spring migration, uh, there are actually, I think four or five other possible vireos <laughs> that we could catch in migration. Um, I have had a 10 vireo day in this region before, which was pretty awesome, um, pretty fun to do. A decent diversity of flycatchers also creating some fun ID challenges. So this is an ash-throated flycatcher and brown-crested flycatcher. So very similar, some habitat preferences that tell them apart and voice is very key for telling them apart uh, among a couple other things. Western kingbird with its white outer tail feathers and gray upper breast versus couches kingbird with its yellow breast Lark sparrow are very common, um, really dapper little sparrow, great song. Um, we also have a lot of bronzed cowbirds. So this is a Southwest specialty. Um, and if you're not familiar with cowbirds, they are brood parasites. So they don't build their own nest. They lay their egg in another bird's nest and that other bird then raises their young for them. Um, and in this region, we have both brown-headed and bronzed cowbirds. And just uh, an interesting observation I've made over the years is that the brown-headed cowbirds, uh, in this area anyway, tend to prefer the smaller songbirds, like the vireos, like the warblers, um, like the sparrows. And the bronzed cowbirds, I often see targeting the slightly larger songbirds, so cardinals and orioles in particular, it's very common to see a uh, bronzed cowbird baby being fed by orioles. Um, anyway, a couple other uh, raptors that we'll be looking for, uh, crested caracara. Um, so you, people either think they're absolutely beautiful or, or they're kind of goofy looking. Um, I think they're pretty awesome. And they, these are a falcon that look like a hawk and act like a vulture. So they love to eat dead things, um, highly, highly intelligent. They'll also pursue their own prey. Um, and uh, yeah, we should have lots of good chances to see them. Uh, we'll also keep our eyes peeled for zone-tailed hawk. Uh, this is a species that mimics turkey vultures. So the theory is that um, prey below are unsuspecting, thinking that this is just another turkey vulture cruising over, just looking for dead stuff. And then they're unsuspecting and the zone tail hawk stoops down on them. And this one in particular has a canyon lizard that it's feeding on. And then more South Texas specialties like black crested titmouse and golden fronted woodpecker. So if the birds have not impressed you yet and demonstrated how cool this place is, maybe some of the other wildlife will. So that is the emergence of 10 to 12 million Mexican free-tailed bats from the Rio Frio Bat Cave, which we will be doing one evening. Um, it's really one of the most impressive wildlife spectacles, in my opinion. Um, Rio Frio is, I believe, the second largest publicly accessible bat cave in the world, with the largest being Bracken Cave uh, just outside San Antonio. That's the largest bat colony in the entire world. So these Mexican free-tail bats 
are really impressive to watch as they come out of these caves. Um, the Rio Frio cave is a maternal colony. So this is where the females go to raise their young. And as we're waiting for the bats to come out, we'll be watching the cave swallows go back in. Uh, they kind of cover the day shift while the bats cover the night shift, going after insects. And then also while the bats come out, we get to watch um, as various birds of prey take advantage of the buffet line. So this is a red-tailed hawk here. Um, but I've also had the fortune of seeing um, Harris's hawks, zone-tailed hawks, coopers, sharpshin, swainsons, um, peregrine falcon, merlin, all going after these free-tailed bats coming out of the cave. It is wild and spectacular. Um, if you're really lucky, you might get to see some mammals, some of the other mammals coming out of the caves um, or going into the caves, um, like raccoons or Virginia opossum, or if you're really lucky, like a ring-tailed cat or something. Other mammals we expect to see, Mexican ground squirrel, uh, super cute, polka dotted, uh, black-tailed jackrabbit, nine-banded armadillo, gray fox, um, they're fairly common in the region. Um, always exciting when we get to see one though. White-tailed deer, tons of deer. And then we're likely to see a couple of what we call Texotics. So these are exotic species that were brought into Texas for hunting purposes that have since uh, escaped their ranches and have become feral. So this is an axis deer. They're native to the Indian subcontinent and they have very much established themselves across the hill country in South Texas. Um, really beautiful animals. They keep those spots all the way into adulthood. Their antlers I think are kind of like between a caribou and an elk or something, um, but really not great environmentally. Um, they can reproduce year round and they can go back and forth between grasses and forbs. So they're really tough on the vegetation, especially around riparian areas. So not the best news to have around, but still interesting to see um, and delicious if you get to try one. Uh, also in this area, there are black buck uh, around, not quite as destructive on the environment from what I understand. Um, and also just really beautiful. Some other things besides mammals, Texas spiny lizards and other lizards are possible to be seen. If we're really lucky, might come across a Texas horned lizard even. Uh, we'll be on the lookout for snakes, both for safety purposes and just for cool wildlife observation purposes. So here on the left, we have a Western diamondback rattlesnake up in a strike position. This is one we will want to keep an eye out for, but they are very uncommon to come across out there. Um, not something that um, we're very likely to come across, but just something to be aware of. And then these two on the right um, are both predators of the diamondback rattlesnake. So up top, we have a Texas indigo snake, which was a formerly state listed threatened species, but just in the past couple of years has been delisted. Uh, thankfully, uh, they have a robust enough population to allow that. Uh, and like I mentioned, uh, they love to eat rattlesnakes, but they'll eat you know, just about anything they can get their mouth on. Um, and same with the bull snake here below. Uh, also, hopefully we'll come across some butterflies um, spring can be a great time to find butterflies in the area. So here on the left, we have a nice common mestra, a couple of border patch here in tandem, a juniper hair streak, really gorgeous jewel tones, and then Empress Lilia here on the bottom right. Um, so in addition to the Naturalist Journeys tour um, in the region, uh, afterwards, if you'd like to extend your stay, um, there is a festival going on called Birding the Border. And this is something else that I will also be guiding separately from the Naturalist Journeys Tour. Um, that's May 6th, or sorry, May 2nd through the 5th. 
Um, and this is run sort of festival style with talks and workshops and things um, and field trips every day that you can choose from going out. And all of the proceeds from this go towards our Young Birder program. So highly recommend you check it out if you wanna keep exploring the area. Uh, one of the cool things about it is we get to uh, go onto a lot of private lands or restricted access properties that you can't get to otherwise. Um, so really fun to get to do that. Um, and in addition, we'll be targeting a couple of particular species that we won't get to target during the tour, like Morlet Seed Eater and Elf Owl. And again, some of these properties that we get to visit are just spectacular. So this is Dolan Falls on the Devil's River. Um, this is on a private property, just these hanging gardens. Um, yeah, just amazing scenery. So again, this is our Texas Hill Country tour through Naturalist Journeys running the 26th through the 1st. Um, and then if you'd like to hang around, highly recommend you check out Birding the Border. It's gonna uh, fall right after that. So some of my other upcoming tours um, through Naturalist Journeys this year, um, we've got listed out here. Um, some of them I know are pretty close to being booked fully and then others uh, still have plenty of room. So a few that I just wanna highlight really quickly are Oregon, Malheur National Wildlife Refuge and Woodpecker Wonderland. This is at the end of May with Steve Shunk. Um, Steve has done this tour many, many times. So I know that I am in, and we are in great hands with him. Um, this is very exciting for me. I haven't been to Oregon in quite a while, um, but Malheur will be in sort of the lower elevations with lots of wetlands and high diversity of birds looking for like yellow-headed blackbirds and uh, lazuli buntings and things. And then the woodpecker wonderland section is up around Sisters, Oregon, on the east slope of the Cascades with I think 10 breeding, I wanna say 10 breeding species of woodpecker in a very small area um, due to the various habitats along the slope of the Cascades as you go up and down in elevation. Super cool, very excited to get to go there. I also have the Alaska sampler trip um, in mid-August. Um, so excited to get to go back to Alaska. It's one of my favorite places in the world. I've been lucky enough to visit a couple of times. Um, this tour will be uh, starting in Anchorage and then heading down to Seward, doing a boat trip out into the fjords around Seward, checking out the glaciers, calving there, uh, looking for things like Kitlis's mirlets and red-faced cormorants sea otters. Um, on that boat trip, I photographed this fin whale. I mean, I've seen orcas out there. Um, amazing. And then we'll head down to Homer, where you'll have the option to fly out and see the uh, brown bears feeding on the salmon run. Like, are you kidding me? That's going to be amazing. So definitely excited for that one. Um, Arizona Monsoon Madness. This is something I do every year. Um, absolutely love this trip. Um, people think August in Arizona, that's going to be blasting hot, miserable, but it's really not, um, it's really not too bad. We're up in the elevation in the mountains, and then we have those afternoon, um, clouds that come in, if not monsoon storms, uh, that kind of cool things down. So looking for things like painted red starts here in the top right, elegant trogan, bottom right. Rivoli's hummingbird. We have a chance for um, spotted owl if we're lucky. There's a Quadamundi here in the middle on the right. Just one of those iconic regions in the US for birding. Um, tons of diversity. Again, kind of like the hill country of Texas where you've got these eco regions all kind of coming together. It's like that, um, but even more with <laughs> everything that's going on. It's just amazing. Um, and then Yellowstone in the fall, again, this is something I get to do every year. And gosh, picking just a few photos from this trip was very difficult. Um, like I didn't even include the geysers and the Grand Prismatics, hot springs. It's just stunningly beautiful trip. Um, usually I do this with Hugh Simmons, who's a professional photographer. So if you're looking to improve your photography skills, highly recommend this one. 
uh, will be there in late September. So the aspens are starting to turn nice and gold. Um, but yeah, just off the charts, scenery, wildlife, spectacular. So I think that's it. So thank you all for listening. And this last image here, um, this is a little grassland area of the brush country with a nice uh, Mexican olive tree or anacoeta blooming. This is a native species. So just how beautiful the brush country can be. So thank you all. Uh, any questions? Let's see. So Brian, we had a few questions about um, how they would pair the Bird the Border Festival with um, the Hill Country trip. And I'm just typing a note to the group that um, Bird the Border is on your own. Um, yes. But if you could talk a little bit about the logistics of how someone would sign up for our trip and then continue on. Sure. Um, so the way I would recommend that uh, doing that is so it's the festival is in del rio so that's about 75 miles further west from uvalde so you could either what i would recommend is booking a rental car either out of uvalde or san antonio for the end of the tour and then hopping into your rental car and driving it over to del rio to join up with the festival um, there's not really a better way I could think of to connect the two. Hope that answers the question. We have another question about if similar species are found nearer to Austin. Mm -hmm. um, so Austin is also in the hill country, but further away from the South Texas brush country. So there's definitely a lot of overlap. You can still find golden cheek warblers around Austin, for instance. Um, but you would not find green jays, for instance, or gray vireos or varied buntings. So definitely overlap, but different. Another um, question is if um, this trip is geared more toward photographers or for birders? So definitely geared more towards birders. That's going to be our priority, um, but definitely keeping good photo opportunities in mind. Um, I'm a photographer myself, so I like providing good photo opportunities when I can to guests, um, but it's definitely not a photography focused trip, if that makes sense. Like we're not going to work for a half hour to photograph one bird. But if there's a good opportunity, we'll take it. Hope that answers your question. It looks like the next questions are um, how to access the recording of tonight's Zoom. We will send that out um, later in the week when we get it all edited and cleaned up. Um, Diane asks, Brian, which of the Bird the Border tours would you recommend to complement the Hill Country tour? Sure. So the ones I would recommend um, to complement would be the Devil's River, anywhere, any of our Devil's River trips. That's getting you further west. So a different, different mix of species. Um, what else? I would say Las Cienegas or the Duck Pond property, also amazing. Um, but it depends on what your priorities are, I guess. And with the festival, there's also a beginner track. So if you're kind of new to birding and you want to focus more on your building your skills, there's a track specific to that. There's also a photography specific track at the festival if you're more interested in photography. So I guess it depends on what your goals are. But I love the Devil's River out there. That is just one of the most beautiful places uh, in Texas, in my opinion. The Devil's River itself is the gold standard for water quality in the state. Uh, just the habitat out there is just spectacular. Highly recommend. There's a question. Um, are you going to be leading any groups on the Birding the Border Festival? I will be. I will be guiding trips 
uh, every day of the festival. I'm not sure exactly which ones I'm slated for. Um, I uh, I help coordinate those trips and the guys out there, but um, I still am not 100% sure which ones I'm on. I'd have to check that out. But um, yes, I do. I do guide for the festival. We somebody asked if the uh, bats will be seen during the eclipse departure of our trip. Um, good question. I would believe uh, I they should be there should be bats around. I'm not sure exactly how many will be there that early in April. Um, they are a migratory species, um, although they're finding that they're migrating less and less now. Um, but the but the majority of them move out of these hills in the hill country down south to Central America. So at what point they come back in spring, I'm not 100% sure. But there should be some around. It just may not be the mass numbers. Uh, Leslie is curious, did the yellow-throated warbler range map show a slight gap between the westernmost range and the eastern range? And if so, why? I believe there is a gap there, and I'm not sure exactly why that is. Um, like I mentioned with that green green J map, those maps are not 100% accurate. So it could be something going on like that where they've just since filled that in, or I'm not sure. In fact, on the yellow-throated warbler map, that westernmost edge is kind of south of where they actually are. So I'm taking those maps with a slight grain of salt. Um, maybe you can answer this as a Texas native. Do you have a sense of the spring allergies during the April trip? Uh, they can be rough. Um, they call it cedar fever. And it's the that ash juniper that we love for the golden cheek warblers, um, unfortunately blooms and it can be pretty bad if you're, especially if you're sensitive to that sort of thing. So pollen is definitely high in the spring out there. So something to be aware of. Good question. Um, somebody's asking if we'll do it in 2025. We do it every year, sometimes two departures. So yes, you can expect it in 2025. Um, Daryl and Lisa ask, apart from the bats, are there any other differences for the eclipse trip? Um, let me double check on that. I think the eclipse trip um, is running the original itinerary. It is. Um, yeah. So that is going to be slightly different. I think for that one, we stay um, at Neil's Lodges the whole time and we don't go out west um, to Kickapoo or Fort Clark. And we hit a couple other spots around the Uvalde um, sort of Neil's Lodges area instead. So this is, that's sort of the original itinerary. And um, the eclipse trip will be definitely the early side for a lot of the neotropical migrants. So, you know, golden cheeks will definitely be there. They start showing up the first week of March. They're very early. Um, but things like painted buntings may be a little early for them. Um, so it's, it's gonna be a little bit different, but I mean, the eclipse, I mean, come on, so. Okay, well, if that's it, we will get signed off. You can send questions to our sales team at travel at naturalistjourneys.com. Um, it does sound like space is filling. So if you are keen to join, you should give them an email pretty quickly. Um, and thank you, Brian, this was okay. great. Yep. Yeah, uh, glad to be here and excited, super excited for this trip. Um, I hope to see several of you there. So thanks very much. Absolutely. Have a good night, everybody. Hey, everyone.